Welcome to part five of a seven and a quarter inch gauge sweep William steam locomotive. This one's all about disconnecting the blast pipe and the wet header in the smoke box. Then comes the difficult part. A blast pipe just does what it says. It guides the blast from the cylinder's exhaust up the chimney, which in turn draws the fire. Originally, I could not figure out how this one was fixed, because it went through a steam union in the floor of the smoke box. And when I undid the union nut, nothing happened. I couldn't pull the pipe out. I tried tapping it with a piece of wood, gently of course, but that didn't work. This union in the bottom of the smoke box is just to seal the pipe, because you need to have a vacuum in the smoke box when the engine's running. The pipe continues through this fitting down into the threaded T-piece, which in turn connects to each of the cylinder's exhausts. Once I figured that out, I could unscrew the blast pipe with ease although I did have to use a pair of grips to undo it. A piece of brass hexagon, silver soldered onto the copper pipe somewhere near the bottom, would have been a good idea. This engine has been problematic to the end. I removed the blast pipe, then I found other problems. I could not undo the union nut, which connects the wet header inside the smoke box to the main steam inlet to the cylinders outside the smoke box. The double union that connects the two pipes together was a bit chewed up, but this is not my doing. From now on though, any further marks will be my fault. I'm using a pair of grips to hold the fitting so I can undo the pipe on the inside of the smoke box. And once that's been done, I will keep the grips in position while I slacken off the union nut on the outside of the smoke box. So far, almost every bolt and connector on this engine has had to be spanned off all the way. This is due to radical over-tightening of the parts. Even when it should have been slack, it wasn't, and I had to spanner it all the way to the end. Finally, though, I did manage to disconnect this side of the wet header pipe. And why is it called a wet header? Well, normally on a steam engine, you have a wet header which feeds the superheater and then the steam is much hotter and goes to the cylinders, but this engine does not have a superheater, so the wet header connects directly to the cylinders. And the cylinders are fed with what is known as wet steam. After removing the union nut on the other wet header pipe, it's time to remove the wet header itself. This is connected to the boiler with three stainless steel Allen cap head bolts. And as my Allen key wasn't long enough, I used a pair of grips again, this time a small pair, to allow me to unscrew all three of the stainless steel Allen cap head bolts. This was a very simple job, which is possibly one of the first on this engine, and in no time at all the wet header was loose. And here you can see just one of these quite long stainless bolts. When I got to the third bolt, the blower pipe was in the way, so I removed it. Just in case you don't know what a blower pipe is, it's a piece of copper pipe that connects all the way to the turret and allows you to direct a jet of steam up the chimney to draw the fire when the engine is stationary. Often without an exhaust blast when the engine's running, the fire can actually blow back into the cab. It does so in the full size too. With the pipe out of the way, I can remove the last bolt and here is the wet header, complete with a silicone o-ring to seal it against the boiler. I didn't bother showing the next part of the job, it was just a case of unbolting the smoke box from the saddle. And guess what, with the exception of one, all of the nuts on the bolts holding the saddle in place were tight. It's worth mentioning that before I started to remove the smoke box from the saddle, I pushed a folded piece of cloth firmly into the T-piece, which is the exhaust from the cylinders. I don't want any nuts and bolts in there. Originally I wasn't going to remove the smoke box, but the boiler was quite a tight fit and I could not get it to disengage. But once I'd removed the smoke box from the saddle, I could rotate it from side to side and work it off the boiler. In any case, I'm going to repaint the smoke box using some heat resistant paint so it will be easier. The fun part has not yet arrived. Here's the boiler sat on the bracket that holds the side tanks and a piece of wood at the back. This boiler is very heavy. I sat it on a block of mahogany, but I needed the mahogany to be at the front, so I used the crowbar to lift the back of the boiler, put the mahogany in place, and then gently lowered the boiler onto it. 
This mahogany is very strong stuff and it's more than adequate to support the weight of the boiler. If you look back at the last clip, you will see that I ground a hollow in the middle of the mahogany to prevent the boiler from rolling off it. And now it's fun time. I have to release the boiler from the chassis at the back. This fitting is entirely wrong in just about every way possible. I don't mean the fitting on the boiler, that's fine. Here I'm lifting the boiler a bit higher and inserting another piece of mahogany because I need to work on this and it's difficult enough without it being too low. Health and safety warning, if you're doing a job like this, make sure any weight is securely held and cannot possibly fall onto your hands. Well, I couldn't believe my luck. These bolts that I thought were going to be a major problem were finger tight. And this does add some weight to my theory that the man who built this engine by this stage was getting really fed up of it. And he didn't even bother tightening these bolts. Which is not good really, but worse than that, there is not an expansion joint. At this stage I'm assuming that the boiler that will be being picked up on Tuesday to go to a professional boiler tester for testing and certification will be the one that comes back to fit on the engine. But at this stage I'm not 100% sure about that, so I'm not going to do any work on these brackets. And if and when I do work on these brackets, I will weld the square piece of steel to the pieces of angle, and then I will elongate the holes that are already there. Well, call it Murphy's Law, call it Sod's Law, or just generally the Chaos Theory. The last of the four nuts was very reluctant to leave the bolt, but I got there in the end. It was just a simple case of persuading the nut to come off the bolt with a screwdriver point. And you've no idea how satisfying that last clip looked. Now the boiler is 100% free of the chassis and can be lifted off by two strong men who will be arriving on Tuesday. Here's a close-up of the method I've been using to move the boiler. My late father's substantial crowbar. Using my Proxon motor tool fitted with some sort of a burr, I engraved a letter R on one of the brackets and a letter L on the other one. The square pieces of steel are only held to the steel angle with two bolts like this, because the excess length of bolt made it difficult to put the nuts on the bolts that come through the sides of the frames. These other holes that you can see will be elongated with a milling cutter in the milling machine. And also I'll be drilling out some of the holes in the steel angle to take larger bolts through the frames, which will also need drilling to match. And that is it for this episode. Stay safe, stay healthy, thanks for watching and I hope you found it useful. Please take the time to visit my Mainsteam Models website and click on the section of the website that says Video Playlists. And by doing that you can find other videos that you may like to watch. And by using the playlists you can actually watch the videos back to back.